Hello everyone, this is uh, Andrea Botezato from Texas A&M University, Texas AgriLife Extension Services. Um, this is our third and final webinar in the wine fault uh, series. This is preventing wine fault. Um, the presenter today is Luke Halcom of Scott Labs. Um, and I have two comments today before we start. Um, I, as you know, probably I am recording these presentations. Now, the microphone that I use picks up all the sounds in the office. That includes me typing and me clicking the mouse. So, in trying to avoid um, unnecessary noises on the recording, I will try to keep typing to a minimum. That means I might have to answer questions at the very end of the webinar. So, there will be um, a question and answer um, time at the end of the webinar and I'll try to keep um, my responses for um, that time. The second thing uh, is there is a severe thunderstorm warning um, in effect in College Station. If that happens and if the internet go, that goes down we might get disconnected so I just wanted to put this out there just in case we disappear. It's probably because of the storm and we will do our best to come right back up. Uh, and without further ado, um, uh, here's Luke with his presentation. Thank you, Luke. All right. Uh, thank you again for inviting me back. Uh, these, these are fun to put together. Uh, I, I find that more presentations that I do, the more I learn. Um, and so it's, it's very beneficial for me. And, and my goal is hopefully that it's beneficial to you guys. Um, I did a pretty narcissistic thing and, and watched a uh, couple of the YouTube recordings uh, that put up and I say uh way too much so I apologize for that. I'll try to minimize that. Also not typing but let's just get into this. We're going to cover prevention of common wine faults. The last few presentations we covered not only identification but remediation. And I'm going to try to focus on the most common wine faults that we see, not all of them. Uh, so let's get into this and we'll go from there. So, winemaking summarized. This is how I look at winemaking uh, in a production environment. It uh, looks something like this. And you're doing this constantly. You're always spinning the plates and uh, managing temperature and microbial populations and production schedules uh, life all at the same time so the the topics that we're going to cover uh, you know are complicated and it can be difficult to focus on everything all the time one concept that I like to use when I think about which plate I need to spin next or which one that I need to focus on is developing something of a risk index for your wines. Uh, and I'm happy to speak offline about that at some point. But basically, it's you identify the wines in your cellar that could be more fragile or more risk adverse than the other ones. I'll put it this way, you know, if you have a, a wine made from moldy fruit that uh, has high pH and a little bit of residual sugar and you had problems with the fermentation um, and you know, that one is going to have a much higher risk index than say, you know, a dry tempered neo that's 14% alcohol and it's got a lot of tannins. So when, when you're looking at what should you focus on? Try to spend your time and effort and energy and money on the ones that uh, you're going to have the biggest impact or the ones that are at the, the greatest risk. So this this is how you, you can determine which plate you need to uh, keep spinning and focus on. So let's get into it. So what are the most common faults? So number one is oxidation. And you'll see in this presentation how this is related to quite a few other faults as well. Uh, oxidation is probably the the number one by volume uh, problem in, in winemaking and in commercial wines. The next would be volatile sulfur compounds. Uh, real quick, you know, hydrogen sulfide, uh, mercaptans, and then the disulfides 
Um, we have microbial faults, which we'll delineate in, uh, as we go further into this presentation. Uh, also really common are protein and tartrate instabilities. I would say most specifically tartrate instabilities. Uh, proteins do happen quite a bit, but I think more people have issues with tartrates. And then we're going to look at cork taint, uh, cooked wine, and geranium taint. In my opinion, uh, I think these are, are the most common, and so we'll get into how to, how to uh, prevent these. So uh, other than oxidation literally being my purpose for living, <laughs> uh, it's, it's also the most common one, and it's exacerbated by smaller container size and headspace. So uh, if you have a 6,000 gallon tank uh, and, and you barrel it down to 100 barrels, you increase your surface area to oxygen exposure. And uh, this, this causes more integration of oxygen into your wine and therefore um, can cause you more problems. And then if you take your barrels and then when you bottle them, uh, you, your exposure goes up again. So when you're, when you're moving wine around and, and putting it into different containers, just know that the smaller the, the container size, uh, the higher risk you have of, of picking up too much oxygen. Um, you know, we we all know this kind of anecdotally from, from bottle shock. I mean, heck, they made a movie about it. Um, but I'm also of the opinion that there's barrel shock. And how this, how this looks is um, when we barrel down, you know, typically we're adjusting SO2. You know, I think a lot of people are in the 50 ppm range. And then they go through their process of, of topping on a regular basis. Uh, and a lot of times you see pretty significant depletions of SO2 when you do go down the barrel. Um, and I think there's a couple reasons for that. Uh, primarily, uh, the dissolved oxygen content of the wine uh, as it goes into barrel is, is really high. And then most people aren't gassing the barrel prior to filling, so there's, it's integrating a bunch of oxygen as you fill the barrel. And then in your process of topping, when you pull that bung off, all you do is you suck in a bunch of air, and then you top with wine that most likely has really high dissolved oxygen content. And so really, you're, you're pretty well staying at saturation of dissolved oxygen throughout the time that the wine spins in the barrel. Um, so I think this is something to be aware of. You know, I like to ask people, you know, how much oxygen is in a is in a vacuum? You know, most everyone says, well, none. And I say, well, exactly. So if you're worried about oxidation uh, because there's headspace formed in the barrel, but you have a good seal on your bone, when you pull it off and you suck in a bunch of air, what have you done? You've actually oxidized your wine as opposed to uh, protected against oxygen. So something to think about. Um, you know, why, why do we do the things that we're doing and, and what effects do they have? Um, so that's just something to, to keep in mind. Uh, and I'll explain a little bit more about that here in the next couple of slides. So oxidation reactions are temperature dependent, but they're also very much catalyzed by the metal content of your wine, uh, specifically iron and copper. Um, in so there's some interesting data out there that shows that while iron is a catalyzer, iron with the presence of copper greatly increases the rates of chemical oxidation. Uh, and so that's that's some pretty interesting information when you're looking at, you know, perhaps using copper to remediate hydrogen sulfide or, or, or captains. Just know that you are putting your wine at greater risk for oxidative reactions to occur. Uh, and we'll get into that a little bit more here. So how do you know if your wine has too much dissolved oxygen? Well, very generally, uh, I can make a blanket statement and say it, it probably does have too much. But you can measure this fa fairly easily with a, a good quality dissolved oxygen meter. Uh, if you don't have one or don't want to invest in one, which I would, I would highly suggest that you do, uh, you, can, you can also use sensory information as well as analytical information um, from measuring your free SO2. If you see large depletions of SO2 throughout the lifespan of your wine, um, there's 
probably a few things going on. Most likely it's oxidation and you have really high levels of dissolved oxygen um, or you have some sort of microbial growth. There are some microorganisms that can produce extracellular sulfur binding compounds, for example, the zygosaccharomyces. So while you may have an adequate level of SO2, you've got a population of these microorganisms that are actively depleting the SO2. And, and once the SO2 is down to a level where it's no longer uh, has any antimicrobial activity, then these little these little guys uh, start having a party in your wine and you've got, uh, got some problems. You know, you can also look at the development of floor yeast. If you have reoccurring development of floor yeast on the top of your wine, and then concurrent production of acetaldehyde, which is the uh, compound specifically responsible for the, the note of sherry, um, then, then it's, it's obvious that your head spaced oxygen is too high and as well as your dissolved oxygen. And then um, concurrently also not enough free SO2. So what does this look like? Now, there's a nice picture of a, a very beautiful floor yeast developing inside of a barrel. Uh, so that's what a floor yeast looks like. And most people have, have had this at one point and are familiar with it, but this is a telltale, you know, bellwether canary in the coal mine for uh, way too much oxygen exposure. So, you know, that if you see that, you, it's a dead giveaway. But let's say your wine is clear and you can't really tell how much oxygen is solution, you can use a dissolved oxygen meter. Um, and this, these, this particular unit here, um, you know, has a range of about zero to 20 uh, parts per million. Saturation of dissolved oxygen is about uh, nine parts per million at, at standard temperature and pressure. Um, and we'll get into this a little bit more. So measuring your SO2, there, there's quite a few different methods out there. Some people have other titrators. Some people use titrate kits. Um, you know, there's the iodine ripper method. Um, I prefer aeration oxidation, um, which is shown here, and also in this picture. And what I want to point out here is the different configurations. So you'll notice, um, I don't know if you can see my mouse, but uh, these are what we re refer to as pair flasks right here. Um, and I've used this. I, I, I like them. They they swirl quite a bit better when, when you're when you're mixing them uh, as as you're titrating to, to look at the color change. They're also a little easier to clean and, and, and get this all nice and clean after you use them. Um, the two issues that I see with them is one, there's no delineation between the the reagent and and, and the sequestering agent here. So you this glass is interchangeable and when it's interchangeable um you know there's a little bit higher risk for contamination uh let's say you're running multiple so2s and you uh, are, are cleaning the glassware in between uh maybe your cleaning methods aren't um, exactly perfect and you swap this one for this one uh, i don't know if you can see my mouse or not but um that's that's one issue i see with potentially with them uh, also, they don't stand on their own. So in your in your preparation steps, uh, I, I use like a 250 or 100 mil beaker to set these things in, so I can uh, use them. Uh, the picture on the right is you know you got a, a round bottom flask uh, where you put the wine and the phosphoric acid, and then uh, you have a cylinder that has the hydrogen peroxide and the uh, uh, SO2 indicator. Uh, which sequesters the free SO2 that's liberated after the phosphoric acid uh, pushes the sulfuric acid out. Um, these, these are nice because there's no interchangeability between the glassware, so there's very little, if any, risk of uh, contamination of reagents and residual wine and things like that. Uh, the, the flask that has, or the, the cylinder that has the hydrogen peroxide actually stands on its own, so it's it's kind of handy to to, to use uh, in the lab, uh, you still have the issue of the ground bottom flask not being able to stand on its own in the lab, and so you have to, you know, probably use a, a beaker just as well. But th those are just little notes uh, about the usage of these 
apparatus and um, something you can think about if you're looking at purchasing a new one. Um, so yeah, there's that. So dissolved oxygen is directly correlated with free SO2 and the depletion thereof. Um, and we'll talk a little bit about how to mitigate that. So basically careful handling will help out a lot. Um, you know, judicious SO2 monitoring and usage, uh, you know, make sure you're checking on your lines on a regular basis and running free SO2s and, and looking for depletions over time and making, making adjustments as appropriate. Also minimizing the, the movements that you put the wine under, the movements being, you know, racking, transferring, filtration, things like that. Every time you do that, just know you're, you're picking up some level of dissolved oxygen. I have a slide coming up that will show you the range that you can pick up. Uh, you can also use inert gas to gas your headspace, gas the tank before you pump into it, purge out your lines, purge your filters, purge your pumps, um, and then also you can, you can liberate dissolved oxygen out of solution by using a gas such as nitrogen to displace it. And we'll get into that a little bit more. Uh, temperature control also has a, a huge effect on how much uh, dissolved gases you have in solution. Uh, so we kind of know this anecdotally, like if you open a two liter of soda and you uh, drink some out of it and then you leave it on the counter, well, it goes flat pretty quick. But if you put it in the fridge, it holds on to that CO2 a lot longer. So the same principle applies to dissolved oxygen. The colder the wine is, the more dissolved oxygen is going to be dissolved, and the, the tighter it's going to hold on to that. So this is one of the reasons why a lot of times producers, uh, if, they, if they have a long-term uh, cold crash and to try to drop out the tartrates, uh, they, they bring the wine, once it is stable, they bring the wine out of uh, cold stability and, you know, rack off the leaves. Uh, and then the wine browns um, and depletes a bunch of SO2, and then you can have all sorts of problems. So just know that when you're doing these uh, processes, uh, you know, looking at temperature is, is important to, to know how much dissolved gases you have in solution. Also, uh, buffering management. So your, your tannin load, uh, your, you can adjust you know, the buffering capacity of the wine with Increasing the tannins, you can do this not only by adding phenological tannins that are available from suppliers, but then also how you do, uh, for example, your cap management um, techniques, uh, whether they be uh, you know, cold soak, extended maceration, more pump overs. Th these are ways that you can manipulate the tannin load and thereby the buffering capacity. Um, also, if you're making hybrids, you know, using fermentation tannins and maybe oak shavings can help to bind up with the endogenous proteins that bind up with the native tannins that are, are in the grapes um, that will, those proteins will bind up with uh, color and, and other tannins. Uh, this is what happens when you have a really nice, really inky wine when it's undergoing fermentation and then Shortly thereafter, it's like all the color drops out. That's that's primarily what's going on there. So you can adjust this using fermentation tannins, oak shavings, um, and then cellaring and finishing tannins uh, downstream. Um, also, adjusting your metal content. Uh, you can use things like specific inactivated yeast to lower the metal content. I've seen this uh, in, in wines that have too much copper that are over the residual legal limit. Um, sometimes producers forget that there are legal limits to things and they just keep adding copper and keep adding copper and then um, they find out they have way too much. And so in order to lower that, you can use uh, things like, we have a product called Rescue, it's specific inactivated yeast, and it can actually significantly lower the uh, copper concentration. Um, so know that that's a tool um, and, you know, the specific inactivated yeast, while they will help lower the metal content, they also have a lot of um, other benefits, which we'll talk about here in a minute. Um, I like to throw this uh, picture out on just about every presentation that I give SO2 uh, and, and the molecular SO2, which is the, the 
antimicrobial form of SO2 um, is greatly dependent on pH. And in Texas, you know, you're usually operating, if you don't do any, any acidulation uh, on, the, on the higher end, you know, 3.6 to 3.9, 4, even, even higher. Um, and so if you look at that, you can see that um, you need quite a bit more uh, free SO2 in order to be um, microbially active. So you, this doesn't mean that, that I advocate for adding 97 parts per million free SO2 uh, to, to get where, you, where you're active at that point. Um, you know, I think you need to be aware of your additions and how effective they actually are. So, and because SO2 um, is antioxidative as well, meaning it, it binds with, uh, with dissolved oxygen, just know that if you're adding 50 ppm, for example, you know, a good chunk of that's probably getting bound up with dissolved oxygen and thereby not having as much antimicrobial activity. So this is where we talk about using inert gases and sparging the wine so it has very little to any dissolved oxygen, thereby making your SO2 ads more effective. And, and its role at that point is antimicrobial and it's not, not doing any antioxidative action because you've removed the, the oxygen. Let's see here. So, um, you know, these arrows indicate, you know, the more movements you do, the more you're going to have to monitor and adjust your free SO2 accordingly. So why is that? Well, the more we move things around, the more dissolved oxygen we pick up. But, you know, the marketplace demands, you know, a brilliant, clear, stable product. And the picture on the right, you know, shows what people are expecting. Um, and that, that, this was after a cross flow filtration. You know, they, they don't want tartrates. They don't want hazes. They don't want turbidity. Uh, they want this brilliantly clear wine that refracts the light very well. And it's a really pretty glass of wine. So what does this require of us? Well, this means we're settling, we're racking, we're potentially fining, filtering, um, you know, and so these things are all related. So when we settle, this, this happens faster and more and forms more compact leaves at lower temperatures. But as we discussed earlier, what happens at those lower temperatures? Well, we dissolve more dissolved oxygen, which finds up with SO2. So th this, is, this is a problem that we have to address. Uh, fining, um, you know, I'm not a huge advocate of fining if you can avoid it, because um, it is potentially stripping depending on which finding agent you use. Um, also, a lot of them are animal derived and I am not a vegan by any stretch of the imagination, but, um, you know, I always have found it quite strange how we figured out that the bladders of sturgeons uh, are, are a good finding agent. I wonder what people were doing um, to figure that out. You know, I know, I'm, I'm sure a lot of that was, was done in the laboratory and it wasn't just uh, people dumping fish into the wine. But anyways, it, you know, if we can avoid using animal derived products, um, you know, personally, from a philosophical standpoint, I, I would prefer that. Um, but that's, that's up to every individual producer's um, mentality. Um, so th but this is, this is a way that we can uh, remove undesirable components, but also uh, aid and and accelerate the formation of leaves. Um, filtering, this is also a, a very powerful tool. Um, you get not only, it decreases in turbidity so you get better clarity, but you're also, uh, depending on the grade and, and what you're doing, you're also removing uh, populations of microorganisms. Um, but it can be pretty frustrating, especially if you're dealing with wines that have been made from uh, grapes that had quite a bit of mold. Uh, there's things called glucans that can make a wine just about unfilterable. And so then you have to, have to deal with that. Um, you know, you have to buy the equipment and the media and, uh, you know, use that on a regular basis. And so, so there's definitely a, a cost involved there. Um, and, and filtration can be potentially frustrating. It's totally nav uh, navigable waters. Um, but, you know, this is, kind of a nebulous thing for a lot of people. They say, well, I've always used 
you know, K300s and K100s and EKs. And it's worked every time in the past. Why is it not working now? Uh, you know, it's a complicated discussion. Um, and I'm happy to have that offline with, with people. Um, we also have uh, Maria Peterson, who's on staff. She's our uh, filtration specialist, and she has forgotten more about filtration than I'll ever even pretend to know. Um, so we have some really good resources uh, that we can bring to bear for you. Um, but, you know, through all of these settling, finding, fil filtering uh, operations that we're doing, we are picking up a lot more dissolved oxygen. Um, and this is causing aging issues. Um, so we kind of briefly touched on this earlier that gas solubility is inversely related to temperature. So as your temperature goes up, your solubility goes down. Vice versa, the, the colder the wine, the more gas you can solubilize. Um, and this goes for CO2, this goes for oxygen, uh, any dissolved gas. But on the right, you'll see a solubility of oxygen curve. This, this I believe, is actually on water, but you know it's pretty close and it's, it's pretty functional for us. Um, and if you look um, right here, this is where people will typically um, store and cold stabilize at. Look at your solubility of oxygen. It's way, way up there. And this is why when you go through cold stability and then you rack off, uh, you see massive depletions of SO2 and a lot of times a grounding occur. So these are the gases that are most typically used in winemaking. Uh, they're not necessarily interchangeable. They have different physical chemical properties um, that we need to be aware of. On the left, there is a mini bulk tank of nitrogen. That's high purity nitrogen. Uh, and one thing I really want to point out when you're looking at potentially utilizing nitrogen in your winery to either uh, gas head space or, or flush out lines or scrub dissolved oxygen, you need to know that the purity of the nitrogen is very important on two different fronts. Number one, the percentage purity. So typically we're talking, this, this tank right here is probably three to five nines, meaning 99.999% pure or five nines, 99.99999. Um, if you, there are a lot of people that have or, or investigate the usage of a pressure swing absorption nitrogen generator, and that's great, uh, except that the purities that you can typically get um, are, are nowhere near what you can get from your welding supplier. Uh, the, the second item to discuss when it comes to nitrogen is you should be using food grade. There is some risk of uh, benzene. Um, so when you do look at getting a nitrogen unit, you need to talk to your uh, gas supplier and then have that discussion about benzene. Um, middle guy, he's cool, right? Um, that is dry ice. And this comes in many different forms. Most typically it's in 10 pound blocks or in pellets. Um, this is really good, easy way to add to a tank, um, you know, toss it into the tank before you pump into it, or uh, as part of your regular headspace management program uh, on a regular basis, um, just toss some dry ice to inert the, inert, inert, inert the headspace. Um, this is, CO2 is not going to drive dissolved oxygen out of a liquid solution, but it is going to displace it out of the headspace. Um, so, that's very handy. Be careful handling, obviously, either liquid nitrogen or uh, dry ice because um, the temperatures that these things exist at um, can cause significant skin damage um, and it's quite dangerous. Uh, then you have argon there. That's a pretty great gas to use. The biggest issue with it is the cost. Um, and we'll get into that a little bit here. So nitrogen is lighter than air, so it does not do a great job of blanketing the, the wine-air interface, uh, whereas CO2 and argon are both heavier than air, uh, so they do tend to blanket quite a bit better. However, if, if you were able to look at the gases and could actually see them uh, in a headspace, you would, you would see a lot of effect there's there's a lot of mixing that does occur so 
adding CO2 and argon uh, and, and, and relying on a 100% blanketing effect, it doesn't always work. Um, but nitrogen is an effective gas scrubber. So using a carbonation stone to remove dissolved oxygen works very well. Um, it has very low solubility. So you're not going to get nitrogen bubbles. You can get nitrogen bubbles uh, under pressure. Uh, we all might know this uh, from drinking Guinness. That's what uh, that's, that's the bubbles in Guinness is nitrogen. Um, CO2, the, the concern here is um, it has really high or relatively high solubility. Uh, so you can entrain CO2 bubbles into solution fairly easily. So just know if you're using dry ice or you're using gaseous CO2, um, that can persist. And where, where I see this uh, in the past has been an issue for some people is they keep the wine pretty cold and are dry, adding dry ice on a regular basis to uh, manage their headspace. And then they take that wine and they bottle it uh, at, at a cold temperature. And then they put it in their warehouse and it warms up 20 degrees and the CO2 comes out of solution and starts to push corks out and uh, all sorts of other things. And then uh, you, know, you might have a slightly spritzy Cabernet. Um, which I don't know if that's what you're necessarily going for. Um, it's cheap, available in many forms. Um, argon, like I said before, is it's, it's heavier than air. It has very low solubility, so it kind of acts as nitrogen uh, insofar as that. Um, but it is expensive because the relative quantity in the, in the environment is pretty low, so it takes a lot of work to get argon out of the air. So the... These are concerns that you should look at when you're trying to uh, apply uh, inert gas usage in your winery. Um, the other thing is, please vent your tank when you're using these things. Um, you should have a two-way vent on your tank to allow pressure to escape and uh, to let air in if a vacuum does occur, um, because you don't want that to happen. And that's actually a wine tank at a winery uh, in California. So. They created a vacuum that was probably done by um, steam. Perhaps they were trying to steam sterilize it and they, they didn't vent it properly and it collapsed upon itself. Uh, the, the opposite is true as well. If you don't let pressure escape, you can blow a tank very easily. Tanks are uh, seemingly very strong, but it takes very little internal pressure to, to maybe rupture a weld or um, cause some other pretty serious things to occur. So um, have, have a functional understanding and respect for uh, using these things is, is appropriate. So the takeaways for dissolved oxygen, SO2, and, and buffering, um, you know, CO2 and argon for headspace management, I think is appropriate. Uh, I recommend scrubbing with nitrogen um, basically every time you move a wine. Um, and cold wine, uh, you can entrain more dissolved gases. Um, and if you look at how quickly oxygen can be picked up, um, 1.5 mg uh, can be absorbed in the first hour and it's saturated by hour four. So this happens fairly quickly depending upon your temperature. And we'll look at this right here. This is a pretty good study that was uh, done looking at the different rates of dissolved oxygen um, and when it can occur. Uh, so, you know, filtration 0.5 to 2.5, and let's say you're doing some racking as well. Uh, well, you're already, after coming out of fermentation and doing just a couple actions in the cellar, you're probably at saturation of, of nine parts per million, um, maybe even higher if your wine's colder. And then, you know, if you rack, uh, if you do splash racking, which I highly discourage, um, you, you entrain a lot more. Uh, you know, if you use a centrifuge, you can pick up quite a bit. Cold stabilization, you see those numbers are really high there um, for aforementioned reasons. Bottling, can you can pick up quite a bit. This is where you get your bottle shock. Uh, and bulk transport. Um, I've seen stuff that, that was shipped across the states uh, go from zero, basically, parts per million dissolved oxygen to uh, six to seven ppm uh, just in, trans in transit. So, what you got to do here. You got to uh, got to be a ninja um, when it comes to this kind of thing. So, if you want to be a hippie winemaker ninja, uh, how do you manage this? Um, you know, if you don't want to use uh, sparging because uh, you're afraid that you're going to rip out 
positive aromatics, which I would anecdotally say does not happen as much as we fear it does. Um, you can you can increase the buffering capacity, like I mentioned earlier, by using enological tannins uh, or oak barrel aging uh, or barrel alternatives can also help you with this. Um, you can just do slow and low winemaking. So know, know your tannin load and your oxidative exposure. And, um, you know, if it's a really big tannic wine, uh, you know, maybe you can throw it around a little bit more than you can your uh, Chardonnay, for example. Um, know your pH and SO2 balance. So if, you, if, you're, if you're judicious uh, in using your SO2, uh, according to pH, you can, uh, can buffer that uh, dissolved oxygen that does get picked up. And then also container management. So, um, you know, maybe keeping things topped up is a good idea. Uh, and... You can also manage your metal content, like I mentioned earlier, using specific and activated yeast or polyvinyl products like PVPP or PBI. Uh, also, kind of certain kind of sand products can have uh, metal reduction. Um, so there's a lot of tools that we have in our toolbox. Um, leaves, I kind of want to talk about this. So, so we have... We have a product called Pure Leaves Longevity that uh, has been shown to consume quite a bit of dissolved oxygen when used appropriately um, but you can also do this with the leaves that you have in your winery uh, so after fermentation is done and you rack off now you've got all those leaves well what do you do with it you know if you wanted to be kind of holistic and natural in your winemaking and didn't want to buy too many additives uh, you know perhaps you could use your leaves as as a fining agent or a sequestering agent uh, and adding it to perhaps uh, problematic wines or wines that have too much uh, oxygen exposure. Um, you know, obviously you have to be careful there uh, on, on on how you do that um, and, you know, what wines you blend with what. So you, you obviously don't want to take your Cabernet Lees and uh, add it to your Chardonnay um, unless you want to make a back-end rosé somehow. Um, so this is why I'm asking the question, can we use our Lees more effectively? And... This is probably you know, extreme winemaking. Um, most people don't really do this much, but some people do. Um, so racking the barrel uh, with quite a bit more leaves maybe is a good thing to buffer some of the oxygen you pick up. That's, that's, an, that's an appropriate application of this. Um, so volatile sulfur compounds. So I think primarily um, one of the best ways to prevent this is in your yeast handling and yeast selection. So really don't want to shock your yeast. And this starts um, from even the way you store the dried yeast. You want to keep it away from uh, high humidity. If it's an open bag, um, you also want to keep it in a cold or cellar temperature environment. Um, and you don't want it to be exposed to great temperature fluctuations or, or humidity fluctuations. So if you keep it in a refrigerated um, or, or air-conditioned room is, is probably the best. Um, I recommend the, the use of rehydration nutrients such as GoFirm or GoFirm Protect Evolution to help build those uh, sterols in the, in the cell wall, uh, which will help to maintain cell wall fluidity and thereby um, helping the yeast protect itself against the alcohol that it produces. Um, so this 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 helps uh, prevent yeast from getting stressed towards the end of the fermentation. Um, and also you get better uh, viability and vitality of the yeast. Uh, and rehydrate at the, uh, the recommended rate um, with uh, the proper rehydration protocols. And it's really, really important, in my opinion, to atemperate your yeast inoculum. This means, you know, you, you're, let's you walk through it real quick. You know, you use uh, good quality uh, chlorine-free, soft, not hard, but soft water. Um, you get your yeast in suspension, and then you follow the rehydration protocol, um, and you slowly add um, must or juice to the yeast preparation to get them used to the high sugar and acidic environment that they're going to eventually go into, but also to lower that temperature from you know, let's say 103 down to uh, whatever your juice temperature is. 
and we generally recommend uh, a temperature differential of no more than 16 degrees uh, Fahrenheit. So that means if your wine is, or if your wine is, let's say at 50 degrees, you want to get the yeast preparation down to at least 66 degrees before you add it to the to the juice. Uh, I recommend pitching over the top. There's a couple reasons for this. One, um, they don't experience any hydraulic shock. As this would be emblematic if, if you pumped the, the the yeast in through the bottom valve. Now you now you have the head pressure of the tank being exerted on the cell wall um, and cause quite a bit of damage that way. So you pitch them over the top, let them just float on the top of the, the juice. Also, uh, because they're at the top, they don't have to saturate the liquid with CO2 and they immediately start producing CO2 in, in inert the headspace with their biological produced CO2. Um, you also want to protect against thermal and osmotic stress. We, we, we talked about that a little bit. Uh, also prevent mechanical damage. So you don't want to use, uh, let's say, a, a really, really fast mixer to mix your yeast after you want to do this uh, very slow and by hand. Also uh, optimizing your yeast nutritional status by measuring your yam and then using uh, proper and high quality nutrients is important. Um, I found that using DAP exclusively or products that contain DAP as part of the formulation uh, tend to actually uh, stress the yeast to a certain extent uh, and this can promote the formation of uh, volatile sulfur compounds. Um, so switching or try, at least trialing um, something like Fermate O, an organic yeast nutrient, um, can really uh, improve aromatics and reduce the production of volatile sulfur compounds. Um, potentially, you also want to oxygenate the yeast starter. So this is this is that whole splint, the balance that we're trying to strike. Like at some points in the process, oxygen is great, and at other points, it's not. Um, this volatile sulfur compounds like H2S and things like that can be produced from um, the elemental sulfur that comes in from the vineyard, maybe as a sulfur spray that they did in the vineyard. So you want to work with your grower and know, uh, based on the harvest interval, when, when the last time they they used a sulfur spray. Um, also, splash racking is something that, that people recommend. Um, they think that if you splash rack, uh, somehow you liberate just the H2S into the atmosphere and it just magically goes away. Um, but my opinion is that this stuff is, yes, it's volatile, but it's also has some bonding that is occurring. And so it's entrained in solution. And what happens is when you splash rack, uh, it's a, a vinified wine to, to deplete H2S. What actually happens is you increase the dissolved oxygen content, content and thereby pushing H2S into, and, and the mercaptans into disulfide form uh, which are less volatile, um, and so you don't smell them for a while. And then, uh, you know, a month goes by and you get reduction again, and you wonder what happened. And so you splash rack again, and you oxidize even more, and you're just really doing damage to your wine. So you need to you need to deal with the uh, the sulfur compounds. Um, and if you want more information on that, I'll refer to uh, the last presentation. Uh, during fermentation, generally oxygenation is a good thing. Um, but generally, once the fermentation is done, I recommend restricting oxygen almost uh, completely. Control your fermentation rate. There's a couple different ways you can do this. Uh, one very common method is by refrigeration of your fermentation, but also uh, just knowing what capabilities you have and, and selecting an appropriate uh, yeast strain that may have a lower um, fermentation activity rate. Um, because you can, you can use certain yeast strains like champagne strains and Viana strains that um, you can have a real hard time controlling the fermentation even through black hole chilling. So this is a way to set yourself up for success by picking the right yeast strain. Um, and when you do restrict dissolved oxygen and potentially drive it out with nitrogen scrubbing, you put your wines in that reductive state, which would be similar to what happens in the bottle after uh, period of time. And those reductive issues that, that we see in bottled wine will exhibit themselves in the cellar uh, 
and then you can deal with those sulfur compounds at that point. So this is one of the reasons why uh, managing your dissolved oxygen is really a win-win-win, and I'll describe yet another win here in a second. So your microbial faults, um, volatile acidity, acetaldehyde, uh, mousiness, uh, which is probably the most disgusting one in my opinion. Uh, if you haven't tasted it, um, either you are not sensitive to it uh, or you, you have trouble uh, identifying it because it hasn't been shown uh, before. Uh, this is not odor active, so you can't smell it. Um, and you really can't taste it until you swallow the wine and this saliva in your mouth dilutes the pH uh, and raises it up to where this compound becomes uh, perceptible. And people describe it as uh, mouse urine or, or, or kind of candy corn flavor. Uh, and it's quite objectionable. Uh, if you're one of the lucky people that can't taste it, um, good for you. But the people that can, uh, once, they, once they have identified it, um, it's usually something that they can never forget. Um, ethyl acetate, uh, na nail polish. So uh, this this is pretty common, especially with uh, grapes in, in fermentation conditions that don't progress in a timely rate and you don't get your um, yeast going quick enough. Um, so, you know, long haul truckings can, can cause quite a bit of ethyl acetate is also can be formed post fermentation. Um, so one of the ways that we can control this and prevent it is by managing our, our pH levels by using uh, commercially available acids that we can add. This also can affect your picking decisions. Um, so, you know, rather than picking at, you know, 27 bricks and 3.9 pH, maybe you want to look at um, making a more delicate wine that has a little bit higher acidity and, and lower alcohols. Um, and we'll get into pH a little bit more here. Uh, manage your microbial population. So this is done through settling or clarification, uh, also filtration and fining aids. And so this picture right here is um, a wine post racking and that's leaves that's left, uh, left in the tank. Um, so that's, that's our most common uh, microbial population control that we do is racking off the leaves. But if you do get a bloom of Britannomyces or uh, you know, maybe a bacterial bloom and you have a lot of turbidity in your wine, you can do things to uh, fine or filter those populations out. Um, also, uh, dissolved oxygen, again, binds up with SO2. And so the more DO you have, the more SO2 you need and the more that gets depleted. And all of these help uh, to promote the development of VA, acetaldehyde, mousiness, and ethyl acetate. So it's really super important that we should have control of dissolved oxygen. pH control, there's a nice little graph that gives you an idea of the different reactions and things that can occur at various pHs. And so you can see that if you have lower pHs, you have a much more stable wine, uh, much, much, much better on a number of different fronts. If you do want to acidulate, uh, there's two links there to go to uh, addition calculators. Um, what I like to do with reds that are going to go through malolactic, uh, use primarily tartaric. Um, whites, I like to mimic the na the natural uh, acid profile, which would be like two thirds tartaric and one third malic. It gets a little tricky when you're when you're actually making an acid add because of the different um, impacts on, on grams per liter and how it actually affects the pH. So highly recommend bench trials. Um, and then I typically do like 75 to 85% of the calculated ad um, and see what sort of pH shift I get and then touch it up afterwards. So this, this requires quite a bit of trial and error. And um, that's why I err on, on adding smaller amounts of acid rather than more um, because it's really hard to get acid out once you've added it. Um, this is another very common microbial fault that I see and this is produced by um, native malolactic fermentation. So you are not using a commercially available non-biogenic amine producing bacteria. Um, you, can, you can have these histamine, tyramine, putrescine, and cadaverine being produced. 
Um, and yes, putrescine and cadaverine are as bad as you might imagine they are. And histamines, um, we are familiar with histamines and antihistamines when we're talking allergic reactions to things. And so um, this is where we get red wine headache. Um, so you can see that if you, if you use a commercially available malolactic strain, you can really prevent uh, some, some really bad stuff from happening. Um, and, and I mean, I've had wine that immediately, in just taking one drink, um, I have a horrible, horrible headache. Um, it was also pretty bad wine, um, so it kind of smelled putrid. So this is what can happen. Uh, so preventing microbial faults for takeaways are timely processing. You know, if you've got long haul um, grapes coming from the high plains, coming down to Fredericksburg or College, State, College Station or, the, you know, that kind of thing, maybe you want to look at inoculating in the vineyard uh, or in the macro bin with uh, perhaps a non-fermentive, uh, non-saccharomyces strain uh, like our Gaia uh, to, because especially with stuff coming out of the high plains that's high pH, your SO2 that you add at that point, you know, 30 ppm or whatever out in the vineyard, it's really not that effective. Um, so there's other tools in our toolbox that we can use uh, to, to help prevent some of these things from occurring, um, you know, on the road. Uh, fermentation management, so getting a nice, good, steep curve and getting things through primary fermentation uh, at, at a good rate. And then also, especially malolactic fermentation. So if you get a stuck malolactic, that's where you get the, the growth of uh, Britannomyces and other bacterial sources that produce these biogenic amines and produce ropiness and volatile acidity and mousiness. So uh, monitoring your malolactic fermentation is super important. Um, again, back to microbial population control. Um, you know, you want to have good temperature control, good pH management, SO2 and dissolved oxygen, and also clarity. Clarity is one of those things that just visually you can tell if you've got a microbial uh, problem. Uh, if your wine is clear and then a couple months later it's not, you probably have a bloom or something. Uh, and as always, hygiene and sanitation. So, um, you know, if you have very good sanitation and hygiene and you're not spreading and promoting the growth of these bad microbial populations in your winery and on your in your tanks and in your barrels, um, you know, you, you, you can really limit your risk. Uh, this is why I recommend like a really good barrel cleaner uh, for your barrels, one that's really high pressure and uses hot water to really blast those populations down uh, and then proper barrel management as well. So real quick on protein and tartrate instabilities, uh, you know, I, I consider I mean, I really don't have a problem with, with hazy tartrate and stable wine. I, I actually prefer it because it usually means that it's, it's been handled a lot less. Uh, but the market doesn't like it. So with protein and stable wines, uh, you know, heat, heat instability, uh, you can use uh, fermentation tannins on the front end as juice um, to help bind up with those endogenous proteins. Uh, this is would be like a preventative addition. So you're adding something to build, also build structure, but to bind up with these proteins. Whereas using something like bentonite uh, is a curative sub subtraction. If you're going to use bentonite, it's probably best to use it at the juice stage um, rather than downstream as a fully vinified wine. It, it's uh, much less detrimental uh, at the juice stage. Uh, tartrate instabilities, so you can do your traditional cold crash, but we talked about earlier why that may be a problem with uh, dissolved oxygen and SO2 management. Um, and sometimes, you, you know, you can, it takes a long, long time for things to uh, get cold stable that way, and it costs quite a bit of money to run, run those chillers. Um, you can use tartrate inhibitors. There's quite a few on the market uh, that can, that have different properties and different costs associated with them and, and different uh, applicabilities but you can really prevent uh, the tartrate dropout in, in the bottle by using these and you will not have to go through traditional cold crash. Um, then also managing your potassium and calcium levels. This is maybe more difficult than in the other two, but this would involve uh, you know, site selection and clonal selection and, and nutrition regimes out in the vineyard um, and so on and so forth. So that's, that's, that's a little bit more difficult to work with. Um, so 
there's a, an example of a protein in stable wine. It's stable on the right, not stable on the left. That's what the haze looks like. Um, this, as we all know, these are the wine diamonds, right? Um, funny about this picture, that's, a, I believe, a Sauvignon Blanc, uh, and it's 14.5% alcohol. Um, that's scary. That's what it looks like. So cork taint. So it's kind of a blunt term that we use uh, because it's not necessarily from cork. Uh, it, it can be pulled from cork, but it's, it can you can't have environmental um, sources of this. So and it's not just TCA. There's also other halogenated anisols like TDA, tribroma anisol, and pentobroma anisol, and so on and so on um, that can cause this. So if you have um, you know, the blue chet pallets that uh, are used in, in shipping food that have been treated with methyl bromide, um, you could potentially be having an environmental TBA issue that you promote for the growth, especially if that pallet is sit sitting on a concrete floor and there's a moisture from, you know, the water, rinse down water, um, and you have mold growth on the pallet and there's bromine there, boom, you've got an environmental source of uh, TBA. Also, you know, using Chlorine is really, I hope nobody's doing that anymore, um, but that is, has been a source in the past for environmental PCA. Um, and these cork taint halogenated anisole compounds are migratory in that they go from areas of high concentration to low concentration through the air. So if you have a tank uh, that doesn't have any TCA uh, and you have the, the tank next to it that does, it'll migrate over. So that'll keep you up uh, so prevent mold growth, um, and if you look to the right, I uh, gave a link and a picture there for the aeroside units. Scott Labs used to sell these; we don't anymore. Um, I suggest looking into that. But you can you, it kills mold spores. It will eliminate TCA and TBA. Uh, it also will kill other spores like uh, breath and, and and things like that. And so if you have if you have mold issues, this is a really good way uh, to deal with that. Um, and limit your phenolic sources. So primarily wood and cardboard and paper. I try to eliminate those from your, your, your processing areas. Uh, plastics and rubber, I think that's a little harder, but you know, maybe you want to look at a stainless shovel as opposed to a plastic shovel. Um, and then, you know, rubber as well. But you know, these are these are things that are kind of hard to completely eliminate. But just just be aware that if you have a, a rubber hose coiled on the ground with a little bit of water, maybe some residual wine, and it grows mold over a period of time, you've got the recipe for environmental cork paint. Also, you can get it from corks. I would suggest buying good corks, good quality corks. Um, you can do sensory screening on, on different lots that you purchase. Um, you know, I think Scott Labs has some of the higher quality, lowest TCA corks, but of course, every cork supplier is going to say that about their corks. But um, yeah, cooked wine, um, and this is exactly what it sounds like. This happens a lot. Uh, so, you know, maintain proper storage temperatures of your, of not only your bulk wine, but also, um, your, your finished product control your fermentation temperatures. So one of my, uh, if I'm ever buying a Pinot Grigio, um, I only buy Pinot Grigio in a Flint bottle. And if it's clear, if it looks like water, I do not buy it because it usually means they fermented it way too hot and the wine is going to smell and taste like rubber and uh, very cooked. So I like to, I like to see some color um, in, in, the, in a Flint bottle for, for that. Um, and then, you know, this also can happen in distribution. So, you know, you need to have that conversation with your um, retailers and your vendors and people that are buying your wine and storing it and serving it to customers that they are uh, not holding things um, in, in an unrefrigerated, uninsulated environment, especially in Texas in the summer. Uh, geranium taint. So this is fairly common. And we got a little bacteria. And you add in a little bit of potassium sorbate to prevent yeast refermentation. And uh, then you get geraniums in your wine. So how do we prevent this? Well, uh, it's, a, it's, it's a microbial defect because the bacteria are actually using this the sorbate as a food source and they produce the geranium taint through that. So again, proper SO2 levels, proper DO management, and then you got to you got to manage your bacterial population. So uh, you know maybe you need to do some some pretty rigorous filtration 
you could eliminate using sorbate in wines containing residual sugar um, by doing sterile filtration um, and sterile packaging, or we're using uh, products such as Velcro. Um, really, uh, that's it. Um, it was right at an hour, which I'm, I'm glad I hit that. So at this point, I'll turn it over and uh, if we have any uh, questions or comments, I'll try to add them or answer them. Thank you, Luke. So, yeah, if you have any questions, please um, let us know. You can type them in the question and answer box there or the chat box, either or. Excellent presentation. Thank you. Um, and you're welcome to email me or call me if you have any questions that you want to take offline. Um, that's fine. I'm happy to. Uh, answer them and then you know if I don't know the answer I won't uh, steam you. I'll get you to the person that, that does and we have a lot of resources that we can bring to bear for that so um, so tartrate inhibitors um, we sell Claristar which is a manoprotein yeast derived uh, tartrate inhibitor um, you know you, you need to do bench trials um, we also sell CMC. CMC has some issues with uh, protein interactions and can cause some heat stability issues. Um, it's also very difficult to handle, like actually prepare and use, um, and can have some filterability issues. Uh, it's pretty inexpensive. Uh, it's, it's quite a bit much less expensive than Claristar, um, but it does have some, some eccentricities to it. Claristar also will give you, because it's a man of protein, um, it actually gives you some mouthfeel improvements. So that's um, uh, pretty nice. And it can be it can be added directly into the bottling tank. Um, there's also, uh, an artist has a product, uh, Zenith, that is a, a tartrate inhibitor. Uh, my understanding is it's not yet legal for use in wine, um, but uh, yeah, Zenith, Zenith is an option too. Um, so, yeah, if you want to talk more about tartrate inhibitors, I, I can give you a rundown via email. I had a question about dissolved um, oxygen. Um, and yep. you mentioned nitrogen scrubbing. Um, how long do does one need to do that? Um, so, assuming we don't have a, a device that um, gives us the oxygen, the dissolved oxygen in the wine value, um, do we just go by what, by time, by volume of tank? How, how do we figure out how for how long we need yeah. to do that? So that's, that's actually very easy. Um, and what it is, you need five volume changes uh, with high purity nitrogen gas. So what that means, we'll give you an example. Uh, if let's say you have 500 gallons of wine that you're assuming is at saturation of dissolved oxygen, that means you need 2,500 gallons of gas to bubble through. Um, and so that would, you can do some conversion. I think it's about 340 cubic feet, which is about 100 pound gas cylinder. Okay. Um, so eventually you'll use, if you do that method, which definitely works, you're going to use so much gas that you'll pay for a DO meter at some point. Right. So, yeah. Makes sense. And for the DO meter, what, what value should we be aiming for? for the um, I, I think uh, below one for reds and below half a part per million uh, for whites. Um, right. Interestingly enough, if you talk to a, a competent professional brewer, uh, they would be talking in parts per billion, like 17 parts per billion is what is uh, people try to shoot for in, in beer. Mm -hmm. So this is one of the reasons why beer gets skunky and, and goes bad and why, why fresh beer is better. It's, it's all dissolved oxygen. And it's the same thing with wine. The older a wine is, the more oxygen um, it's been exposed to, uh, the, the more degradation you get. So if you want to, you know, lock in those aromatics, lock in the tannins, and prevent the formation of alto sulfur compounds downstream in the bottle, um, you know, you, you, managing your dissolved oxygen on the front end and dealing with reductive issues in the cellar is really a way to do that. And one of the things that I recommend for people to do is if they don't have a DO meter, um, you know, after bottling, measure your S3SO2 in the bottle after about a month. Um, 
and you'll you, you'll find most of the time that if especially if you're hand bottling and hand corking, uh, you you will have very little uh, SO2 left. If you're using a vacuum corker and a good quality um, bottling line, mm -hmm. you, you can have pretty good pretty good retention of SO2. But you know I like to characterize it this way. I say you know I ask winemakers, have you ever had a tank of wine in the bottling tank it was just beautiful and it's fresh and vibrant and fruity and then you put it in the bottle and six months later it's just completely crashed um, that is dissolved oxygen that is um that is uh, a bottle shock mm -hmm. I have um, another question about manoproteins as tartrate inhibitors are all manoproteins tartrate inhibitors yeah, my understanding is yes to a certain extent um, you know, not all of them are advertised that way. Uh, they do have some colloidal protection uh, activity to them. You know, our, our product Claristar is specifically designed for tartrate inhibition, but I, I would generally say that yes, manoproteins uh, do help to inhibit tartrates. So you can use, you know, manoproteins and gum arabics to help pr uh, promote the um, or, or help to prevent the formation of, of tartrates. Uh, so generally the answer is yes, but to varying degrees of efficacy. Um, do diometers require calibration? Um, yes, they do. Um, depending on the unit, um, let's say, for example, I think a lot of people have thin metricas. Um, that is a zero point calibration. So every time you use it, you have to uh, do a sodium sulfite uh, solution that has uh, the sodium sulfide produces um, or makes makes the liquid completely devoid of any ox oxygen um, and therefore you can you can calibrate the uh, venmetrica that way you teach it you teach it the zero and it, it converts it from there um, the one that I showed uh, there's quite a few different calibration methods the easiest one the one I use uh, it's a sleeve that has a little sponge in the bottom of it you wet it um, just so it's just slightly wet um, and then just hit calibrate and it self calibrates. Um, that's, that's very handy as well. All right, any other questions? And if you want, you know, links to, to buy DO meters and, um, you know, sparging stones and all that kind of thing, um, I'd be happy to provide those. Okay, well, before we leave, I, I'm just going to say, uh, please, please, please take a, one minute to fill out the survey at the end of the webinar. Um, I know it can be annoying, and you've probably done it before, but um, I, I, it really does help me keep these webinars going. So please take a minute to, to do that. Thank you very much. And thank you, Luke, again for a really, really good presentation today. Very informative, very useful, very helpful. I appreciate um, your continued help uh, with the webinar series. Um, yeah, and I, I wish you all a good day, and we'll see you next time. And yes, it will be online. Yes, it will be online. I don't. I didn't see. It. Is there a question about it being online? I don't know, but it will be online. Yeah, <laughs> yeah you're going to put it on YouTube, um, and then I can provide the slides uh, as well. Right, and hopefully less clicking this time. <laughs> <laughs> Well, um, have a good day, everyone. Bye-bye. Thank you.